with uh, uh, our second speaker, Dr. Nadia Katoni. So I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Sorry, uh, Nadia Katoni to everyone. Uh, Dr. Nadia Katoni is senior lecturer at the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations, University of Lausanne, Switzerland. Previously, she was a SNF postdoctoral fellow at University Kafoskari of Venice and an EFEO postdoctoral research fellow at EHESS of Paris. She received her PhD from University of Lausanne in 2016 for a thesis on the Riti poet Dev. Her research area is Braj literature with a focus on courtly poetry, erotics, aesthetics, and women writing. She is the author of, and I read the translated title of the book from French, uh, Dev, artist, poet of the 18th century and Nayaka in the Rasa Vilasa, circulation of his exchanges and intertextual transformation. And she's also the co-editor co of Early Modern India, Literatures and Images, Texts and Languages. We particularly found Dr. Katoni's work on visuality and textuality highly interesting and are very glad to have her with us today. Thank you and uh, you may begin now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nilza. And first of all, I really would like to thank you and to thank Professor Amitav Chakrabarti for your invitation. I mean, it's really for me a great honor uh, to be here today and to share my ideas, my thoughts with, with all of you. So I'm really grateful to thank you so much. So I will try again to share my screen. Is this okay? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You yes. can see your screen. But now it's gone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying again. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm coming here. Maybe I have to do this. Yeah. No, it's not the right one. I would like to have only my PowerPoint. So. In that case, you have to make your PowerPoint as a slide presentation okay but here you don't have it right not yet not ah, yet. it was working before and now it's not so because if i do it big then i cannot have um, this is not working so i go here like that one. Okay. And now yeah, I right. start. Here we are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So um, I will speak around 50 to 60 minutes. I don't know, really depends on how fast I will read my paper. Uh, I try to focus really on the topic of uh, your workshop. And um, so maybe some elements will not be really clear for you during my presentation uh, because I cut them off. So maybe if you need some, um, uh, explanations, some um, more explanation on several topics, you can ask me just at the end um, of the talk. I think we have uh, time for discussion at that moment. So my presentation will be on the writing of a Riti poet, Kavidev, 
And I will try to expose how thinking in terms of intermediality besides intertextuality helps us to understand his poetry and the innovations we find in his compositions of Naïk Abed, a literary genre very well established, established at the time of the poet. I came to reflect upon intermediality when working for my PhD thesis on Dave's poetry. I was especially working on poems dedicated to the description of the Naika in his masterpiece related to this topic, a work named Rasa Vilas, written most probably in the first quarter of the 18th century. Rasa Vilas is a work entirely dedicated to Naika Bedas, and reading them, I was surprised by the uncommon descriptions I found. Besides traditional Naika Bedas, I found new proposal and a style peculiar to Kavide. I couldn't identify it to other Riti poets. Going further, I realized that this had been done in purpose by the poet. Indeed, as we can see in Dev's own words, the aim of the Rasa Vilas is to describe the Naikas in a very new manner. In chapter four, Kavidev says, she, so she is the Naika, has been described in several books by Keshav and all the great poets. I am describing her now in a charming and unprecedented way. If even once I described her following the tradition, I described the Bhavas and Sringararasa when I composed the Bhava Villas, I describe her a second time by creating this book, Rasa Villas. Listen to these classifications of the Naika. They are all of a new type. The time of composition is the beginning of the 18th century. Dev is considered, as I said, a, as a ritical poet. And as you know, Naika Beda is a favorite topic of Riti poets. Creating innovation at this point, after decades of poetry dedicated to the description of the Naika in Braj, is an ambitious project. In 18th century, Naika Beda can be considered as a genre in itself, with its own literary motifs and codes, and Naikas have already been described by the most famous poet, Keshavdas, named by Dev, among others. Nevertheless, in the Rasa Vilas, Dev goes beyond the tradition, breaks the rules, and developed entire new typologies of Naikas. Looking for intertextual references, these new Naika Bedas can be related to specific literary traditions, especially Ka Sanskrit Kama Shastras and Indo-Persian literature. So I won't expand on this uh, now, uh, because it's not a topic of uh, our workshop, but if you want, I we can discuss this later of these re intertextual references I found um, in Dave's works. But these intertextual references are not sufficient to explain Kavi Dave's innovation. It is possible to reflect further. And in this reflection, we, re we reach the topic of this presentation. So would it be possible to trace visual influence in Dave's poetry? And how these traces would help us to understand the poet's choices? How much visuality can be implied in our understanding of Riti poetry. In the words of the film historian, André Gaudreau, intermediality is a concept 
which makes it possible to designate the process of transfer and migration between media of forms and contents. With this definition in mind, I'm interested to use intermediality as an additional concept beside intertextuality to understand Dave's poetry. We will note that during this process of transfer, both forms and contents migrate from one medium, visual sources, to the other, Dave's poetry. The poet's styles, the poem's contents, and the work's structure are impacted during this process. Through the discussion of three examples, I will try to demonstrate how visual references help the poet to create innovation in his Naika Vedas, telling new stories about the Naika. But before considering these examples, first, I would like to say a word about circulation, because circulation of cultural deeds and of people is the basis of my reasoning because circulation creates exchanges and development of new ideas. So circulation. We know that during the early modern period, images and texts were not attached to their place of production. Easily independent images were in circulation along with artists, patrons or viewers, say art historians, among them uh, Molly Etkin. Poetry and more specifically, independent poems could also circulate through performances and orality, but also in written form through compilations and anthologies. In addition, many poets were itinerant, going from, going from one court to another in search of patronage. For Dave, we have several proof of uh, the, circulation, the circulation of his poetry. First, the poet was known by his peers. Dave is mentioned by the poet Sudan is he, is in his Sujan Charitra and by Bikaridas in his Kavyanir Raya. Regarding the oral tradition, some of these poems are quoted in selections from the popular poetry of the Hindus, an anthology compiled by Thomas Ewer Broughton, presenting popular poetry transmitted orally and known by his soldiers. Moreover, in Dev's case, this idea of circulation is emphasized if we pay attention to his writing process and to his biography. And if you allow me, I will take some time to introduce you to this because the innovation and the diversity of the influences including visual sources we can find in Dave's writing are due to the fact that he was an itinerant and prolific poet. At least it is my opinion and my argument. So Dave is born in the last quarter of the 17th century in Etawa, in a Brahman family. He is considered as a Riti poet and has written books on several topics, but in a large majority, he composed Naika Vedas and Sahitya Shastras or Riti Granth. It is particularly for his books related to these two topics that he is considered as a major poet of Hindi literature. 72 works are attributed to Dave by the tradition. 18 are collected in the last edition of his work, which was published very late in time in 2002 by Lakshmidhar Malviya. And I'm really relying on um, Malviya's edited um, volume to work on Dave's poetry.
even if all Dave's works are not dedicated to a patron, and if dates are most of the time missing in the works, I mean, it is nevertheless possible with the information we have to reconstruct part of his network going from Delhi to Asota. The poet was well established in Delhi and around Delhi in various literary circles and milieu. His work, Bhavani Vilas, is dedicated to Bhavani Datta, son of Narendra Sitaram of Dadri, not far from Delhi. We don't know much about him, but Dave tells us in the introduction to the book that he was the grandson of Taval Singh and the lord of a dynasty of merchants. In the city of Delhi itself, Dev was well introduced among the Mughal elites and the literati of the capital, as one of his work entitled Rajaniti is dedicated to a famous figure of Delhi literary life in the person of Amir Khan. Amir Khan, Umdatul Mukh, was a close relative of the Mughal emperor Muhammad Shah. He was influential on politic matters as well as the as on the cultural life of Delhi. Poet himself, Anjam uh, was his pen name, he was known for the, for the organization of farmers Mushairiyat, where great poets could meet. He was an important, sorry, he was an important patron of Persian and Urdu literature, but with Dave we can see that he was also a supporter of Raj literature. Two more patrons are linked with Delhi. One is Bogilal, patron of the Rasa Vilas, about whom very little is known. We can just guess from the Prashasti written by Dev that he was from a Hindu family. And Malviya suggests that he was working in the emperor assembly, but I couldn't find any information about this. And the second and last patron from Delhi was a member of the Kayasta caste, as Dev tells us, named Sujan. Talking only of Delhi and its surroundings, we can see how much the network of the poet is large and diversified. Now, if we leave the capital, Dev's journey Dev's journey stops in Bharatpur. There, he wrote the Suryadaya Prakash for the famous king Surajmal, who was an amateur of literature and supported many poets beside his brother Pratap Singh and his uncle Badan Singh. For Ali Akbar Khan of Pihani in Haldor district, he wrote the Sukh Sagar Tarang a compilation of his previous works also dedicated to another patron, Jaswan Singh from Mainpuri. And this is a good example of Dave's writing process as he was also, he was also recycling his works. With this process, his poetry was spread in different places in a very effective manner. Moreover, we can find in all his works a reuse of his poem at a large scale, using in fact all his poem as a repertoire. Some of the poems are reused, are reused six, seven, even eight type, times in different works, and to illustrate various topics, a naika, a rasa, a season, another naika, as a benediction in the opening of her book, for example. I mean that this is real, he is really involved in this circulation process, even in his writing process. But coming back to his patrons, we find three more patrons. One, Kushal Singh in Papund, for whom he wrote the Kushal Vilas. Then one in a sotar named Jai Singh, son of Bhagwan Singh, himself son of Araru Singh, says the poet. 
the court of backbanting is known for its support to literature. They were also the Mindar and remained famous for their disobedience toward the Mughal Empire. It is the father, Bhagavan Singh, who most probably is the patron of the Jai Singh Vinod, he, he asked for his son. Finally, the third and last patron is Udyota Singh from Dondi Akera. The poet tells us that he was the son of Mardan Singh and from a family of merchants. Mardan Singh was an interesting figure. In historical, chronicle, in historical chronicles, we find him under the name of Rao Mardan Singh from the Bait Rajput land, and we are told that he was a horse's seller. So over this whole uh, network of patrons, it is also possible to add a network of poets as each patron employed more than one poet and organized several literary events where poets could meet. And here I have traced names related to some of these patrons. Of course, it is not exhaustive, but what I want to show is this idea of circulation of cultural deeds and of people, of poets, of artists, taking the examples of poets, but we also can imagine that painters are also moving around the same roads. So here we can see, for example, that Sukhdev Mishra was present in Dondi Akera and Asotar, two places where Dev has been called. Sukhdev Misha was there a bit uh, earlier than Dev, but still, some places are like crossroads for poets. This, in these crossro crossroads, poets, artists, and patrons meet, and there also ideas and traditions can be exchanged. So this is really the base of my argument, this idea of uh, circulation. And now I will go on with my uh, examples. So in, I have three examples and in these three examples, um, I try to trace visual influences in Dave's poetry. Uh, first of all, I would like to clarify here that a direct influence is not implied between the images I will discuss and Dev's poem, as there is no evidence at all of direct contact between the poet and those paintings. Period of times and also places are different. So please uh, <laughs> take care um, of this aspect. But if we assume that cultural deeds artists and patrons are all in circulation. If they move from one place to another, this means that literary and visual motives developed inside these works move too. Since all in most likelihood move on the same roads, they cross each other. In the 18th century, Typologies of women and of men understood in a broad sense and on, not in the restrictive sense of Naika and Nayaka Vedas, but really uh, this idea of descriptions of women and men also for, for example, in um, Ragamala with the Raga and the Ragini. So these kind of typologies were well known in literature in different literary genres genre, as well as in painting in various schools of painting. Visual representation circulating around could also have been a source of inspiration for the poet of this period. Even more, if um, that- I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but uh, uh, only your screen is uh, vi vi visible only partially right now. Okay, 
Visual representation circulating around could also have been a source of inspiration for the poet of this period. Even more, if that poet was departing from traditional ways of writing, as it is the case for Dave in his Rasafilas, as I uh, told you earlier. So my first example is dedicated to Dave's style. So it's um, an example of a transfer of form. So Dave's style when describing the Naika, that is a focus on the female figure. In the classical Naika Beda genre, also the Naika is the main character of the poem. She is often shown in interplay, interplay with other characters who participate in the construction of the situation in which the female character is involved and who highlight the emotional state of the Naika. These characters are the Saki, the Duti, or the Nayak himself. In the Rasa Vilasa, it is the Naika who is in the center of each poem. We don't find dialogues between the various characters embedded in the love affairs of the two lovers. The readers or listeners attention is drawn only to the Naika, her body, her mental state, her gait, her clothes, her voice, and so on. The attention is less on the love situation, which is nevertheless implied, than on the female figure. The description is in the third person. It is an external narrator who describes the Naika. A beautiful example and poetic example is uh, with um, this poem. So this poem is found in the Rasa Villas in a Naika bed called Desha bed, made of 32 poems in which the Naika is described according to the region where she lives. Here, the scene. In these poems, and in other two, no mention of a love affair, no Nayak, no go-between, only the Naika. This special treatment is due to their sources for the writing of this specific Naika Veda that is Kama Shastras of the Sanskrit tradition. But an influence could also come from visual sources as women are depicted alone in paintings too. Doing her bath or scattering lotus petals in her bedchamber in anticipation of her lover's arrival, the focus is, is on the woman and the narrator of the story is the viewer whose gaze is totally absorbed in the contemplation of the female figure. The same process as in Dave's poem, where the narrator is external to the poem, not involved in the scenery. She is the motive, she is the center of the attention. The relationship between the viewer and the woman depicted is direct, without intermediary. Just as the relationship between the reader and Dave's Naika, no need of dialogues go between lover to express who this Naika is and how Sringararasa is expressed through her. This focus on the Naika is a general statement for Dave's Naika Veda, especially when the poet distances himself from the tradition. The second example related to this first one is an example based on a poem dedicated to a specific Naika, a yogini. It is an example of a possible transfer of content here, not on form, from visual sources to Dev's poetry. 
I mean, even if the form is implied because we have this uh, um, Naika alone in the center of the poem, like in the first example. So the Gyokini Naika is described in a Naika bed elab elaborated on the base of uh, the Naika's Jati. It is not a traditional Naika bed, but an innovation for the genre. Like the previous example, the focus is on the female figure. And here is the poem about um, the yogini. The female beggar wanders from one forest to another with the power of her youth. The residents of the forest remain stuck by her mastery of the rag. She plays chikara, she sings sweet melodies. Having heard this sound, the sages remain irritated with this sound in their heads. She charms the great serpent, many trees, snakes, and birds. Having listened, having listened, how many colas and villas keep complaining? The lion, the jackal, and the leopard stand near, looking at her. The spotted deer, the monkey, and the dark-coated antelope remain delighted. As said, the yogini is not a common figure of Naika Vedas. As the Desha Veda, this Naika Veda, based on the Naika's Jati, is very uncommon for the genre. But here, it is not a reference to the Kamasha strict tradition. It is rather a possible reference to Indo-Persian literature. In the Shaharashub genre, we have descriptions of people in the bazaar which have some similarities with uh, Dave's Jati Beta. And uh, we have the works of Sunil Sharma who has worked um, on this genre in particular and of a possible link also between uh, Riti poetry and um, this Shaharashub genre. So, so we have descriptions of people in the bazaar um, which have some similarity uh, with the uh, Jati Beda. But as we will see in my third example, this Jati Beda is very special and show the poet comment on the Naika Beda genre. Okay, we will come back to this um, specific uh, Naika Beda. But first, our poem on the yogin. So three elements seem important here. First, the context of the forest. Second, the fact that the Naika plays music. And third, that she charms all the beings living in the forest. For this description, the poet Dev has designed a scene in which a young woman is charming all the inhabitants of the forest, human beings, animals, and plants with her music. We know that she is a yogini only by the title at the beginning of the poem. Uh, it's not on the slide here, but also it could be also added by the editor. So we are not sure of, uh, of uh, this title present uh, in the first manuscript. And uh, by the use of uh, Yakchaka, the female beggar in the first line. If we think of a yogini, we could imagine another kind of description. For example, Dev could have described the specific color of her clothes, how her hair is arranged, her gait, and so on. Also, she is categorized as a Naika living on the roads. All the Naikas of uh, these Naika Vedas are subcategorized in several groups. The Yogini is a Patikavadu. She could have been described as walking in the middle of a lane and not in the specific context of the forest, even if the, even if the forest is a place for ascetics and seers. But looking at images portraying female ascetics, answers can be found, and we understand why they portrayed the yogini, yagi, the yogini Nayika in such a scenery. 
I found two sets of paintings sharing common features with Dave's description of the yogin. The first set of paintings is discussed by Deborah Hutton in her book, um, Art of the Courts of uh, Bijapur. It is made of a collection of typed portraits of yoginis who are represented on a single page and alone. The paintings discussed are linked to the court of Bijapur and are dated from the early 1590s to 1640. She mentions also later paintings from the 17th and 18th century, also from the Deccan and from Lucknow. Except for one painting, they all show the yogini in a landscape with palaces in the background, and for two of them, the yogini holds a musical instrument on her shoulder. And we have these two yoginis here. One is called Yogini with Vina, and the other Yogini playing a tempo. Deborah Hutton analyzes the whole set of images as intimate, I quote, intimately related to the Sufic ideal, ideals of the lover and the beloved as expressed in literature and poetry, end of quote. She also shows drawing on specific elements such as the jewelry worn by the yoginis that the portraits are closely linked to courtly life. The women who are depicted are in fact noble women disguised as yoginis, this motif being also the purpose of a kind of Urdu romance. So we see here how much these visual representations are linked to literary motives. And Hutton's analyze is completely in adequation with my argument regarding Dave's poetry and with the thematic of this conference on intermediality and storytelling. In Lilian Louvel's words, a French literary critic and theorist, text and images are in an infinite dialogue, as she says. And we have an example here of this infinite dialogue. But coming back to our two paintings, several, several elements are interesting here for our discussion of Dave's poem, as they are in correlation with the yogini as described by the poet. First, the representation of the yogini in a landscape in which the vegetation is prominent. Even if palaces are in the background, the yogini is clearly not in a garden, but more in something similar to a forest. Second, the mu musical instrument held by the yoginis, described as musicians, just like Dave's yogini. Third, the fact that they are depicted alone. The yogini is in the center of the painting and is its main subject. Nothing else catches the eyes of the view viewer, just as the Naika is the central figure of the poem. Fourthly and finally, the treatment of the yogini as a type of woman instead of a specific individual, which is a uh, which is a basic component of Naika Veda. So besides this painting specifically dedicated to the depiction of the yogini, another set of images can be understood as in dialogue with Dave's poem. These images come from Ragamala illustrations. Ragamalas share elements with Nayak Naika Veda such as a gendered representation of male and female in Raga and Ragini. The genre was illustrated, in, sorry, was illustrated early in time and circulated very widely, which increases the possibilities of exchanges. A specific Ragini is particularly stimulating for this discussion. It is the illustration of the Asavari Ragini. In general, she is depicted in a landscape, sometimes 
seated on a rock or a hill, sometimes in a cave. She is surrounded by plants and trees. Most of the time, she looks like an ascetic with appropriate clothes and her hair tied up on her head. She is always shown charming, charming serpents all crawling in her direction and sometimes playing the flute. In some paintings, she is also shown in the middle of the forest with all the elements just described, but also surrounded with several animals captivated by hers. We can see already in the image uh, on the right some animals, um, orders and serpents on uh, the picture. But I want to show the, you that one. As in Dave's poem, the ragini of the painting we have here charms the great serpents, many trees, snakes, and birds. They are all attracted by her, even the trees which are bending in her direction in a movement of attraction and protection. The antelope, the deer, and the lion described in Dave's poem are also present. In the previous illustration, the monkeys were also represented. So the Asavari Ragini is close to the, to the Yogini described in the previous set of images by several aspects. And she is also very close to the Yogini Naika of the Rasa Vilas. And now my third example, and it will be my last one. Here. So with this example, I would like to discuss the structure of an Aika Beda and to think about a possible influence from visual material to the development of one of Dave's Naika Beda, which is completely different from others in terms of its uh, structure. We are talking here of a transfer of form. In general, Nayak Naika Bedas are organized by categories and subcategories. These categories have the format of lists. For example, we have a list of Naikas on the base of her age and experience in love affairs. We have Mugda, Madhya, etc. Then we have a list of Naikas on the base of her marital status. She is Fakia, Parakia, Ganika, etc. Then we have a list of Naikas on the base of the relationship she has developed with her lover. Uh, we have the Ashta Naika, for example, so and so on and so on. We have dozens of lists, one beside the other. The list is the favorite format of Indian authors in an attempt most prob probably to reach exhaustivity. But it is also a literary mode used in narration and discussed by linguists and literary critics and historians. In the words of Umberto Eco in uh, his book on the list, um, the list creates a kind of vertigo. And this is relevant when speaking of works depicting dozens, if not hundreds, of naikas. As a reader, Reading all these descriptions, you get caught up in a kind of vertigo, completely buried under Sringararas. Traditionally and skillfully, the structure of the list is used by Riti poets, by Riti poets and by Dave himself. But in one of his Naikabed, the poet develops a new structure. This Naika Beda is the Jati Beda from which we have just discussed the example of the Yogini. 
It spreads on three chapters of the Rasta Villas, joining together 122 poems, all quatrains. Uh, it's also a work, um, the Jati Beda, who has uh, circulated independently of the Rasta Villas. So this Naika Beda brings together six categories of women. Each category is linked to a geographical space, and at the center of this space is placed a Raja. So I have drawn a kind of diagram uh, of this space in an attempt to show uh, the Naika Beda's uh, structure. So we have this Raja uh, really in the center of the uh, Naika Beda. So at the center of the Naika Beda and at the center of the geography geographical space, which is uh, the Raja's kingdom, we have a Raja. He is the Raja of the world created by Dev. He is the Raja of the world in which all the Naikas of this particular Naika Beda live. The six categories of Naikas live in a defined geographical space, and these spaces are organized from the center to the periphery. From the, from the space the nearest to the Raja's residence to the space the farthest to the Raja's palace. Um, these six categories of Naikas are the Nagari, the literate Naika living in a city, and especially in the same city as the Raja, the Purubasini the Naika living in the city, but in a geographical space, which is after the limits of the city of the Raja. And this is explained by Dave uh, in um, the beginning of the Naika Veda. Then we have the Gramini, the Naika living in a village. The Vanya, the Naika living in the forest. The Senya, the Naika living with the army and the Patika Naika living on the road, the Yogini was placed in uh, this particular category. Then each category, in, in each category, we find descriptions of several Naikas. And for some of these categories, especially the three first, so the three in the center, we find subdivisions being themselves subdivided. So I show you only the first one of the Nagari. So the Nagari is divided in three main categories, depending on where uh, the Naika live. In a temple, in the king palace, or in the king city. The Nagaris who live in the temple are subdivided in three categories. We have the Devi, the Pujanhari, and the Dvarapalika. Then the Nagari who lives in King's Palace is of five types. We have uh, the Rajakumari and all the women who take care of her. Uh, that means the Daya, the Duti, the Saki, and the Dasi. And we uh, find here Duti, Saki, and Dasi, for example, are classical traditional Naika Vedas. In fact, we can find a description of uh, these characters in other Naika Vedas. So inside this very peculiar Naika Veda, we have, um, we have traditional and classical uh, Naika Vedas, which are inserted inside. So then the third category, the Naikas who live in the king's city are divided in two, in two, two. The first category is intended, intended for the shopkeeper's wives and the second for the Ganika, the courtesan. So it's interesting also to see where Dave plays the courtesan. She ju she's just in this uh, liminal space between inside and outside the Raja's place. So 
this is another discussion, but it's really uh, interesting uh, when we are focusing on partisan figures. So for the NICAs of the first category, 10 professions are listed. So we have the jewelry seller, the one who prints clothes, uh, we have uh, the one who strings, um, who makes strings of pearls, the goldsmith, the perfume seller, the oil seller, the betel seller, the sweet seller, the grocer, and the porter. And the, here we have really a connection with uh, Shahar Ashub because we can find this description of uh, the people of the bazaar uh, in that kind of literature. So this is the intertextual reference here. So, and this gone with the other categories of Naikas. Then we have uh, the Naika living in a village, and there we have other professions we, uh, which are described. And we have also a description of uh, women of the four Varnas. And then we go on with the other Naikas until um, the end, uh, the Naikas on the road. So, from the center, circles develop concentric, each defining its own geographical space, the king city, the city, the village, the forest, and so on. Always moving away a little more from the central point. In the center is the male figure, the king, surrounded by female figures living in these spaces. From a literary point of view, this staging is extremely clever for the purpose that the poet seeks to develop, since it places the reader in the position of the king, as the poems are focused on the Naikas. The Nayak, as we said already, is also outside the poem. He is with those who admire the Naika and merges into the king reader, who merges also into the Ratsavilla's patron, Bohilal. So it is here an incredible performance and a great demonstration of Dave's mastery over the Naïka Beda genre. Now, I would like to suggest that Dave could have been influenced in the construction of his Naïka Beda by visual sources. This part is at an exploratory, exploratory, exploratory stage now, and uh, I'm really open to suggestions. Um, but in my point of view, I see two kinds of images which could be compared to uh, the Jati Beda structure. So the first kind or the first set of images is composed by images depicting the Ras Lila. And I give only one example here, and you are missing my uh, marvelous uh, <laughs> PowerPoint uh, <laughs> flashes, but you have the result already. <laughs> so uh, many reasons to think at images picturing uh, the Ras Lila. First, the context. In North India, at the period we are talking about, Krishna Bhakti is really everywhere. Great poets have sung their love for Krishna, and Riti poetry is full of Bhakti references. Krishna and Radha, the dear lovers, remain the, the model of numerous poets writing on the Nayak Nayika relationship. Also, Dev's poetry is full of Shingararasa and erotical descriptions of the Naika in a pure Riti style. It is also largely influenced by Bhakti motifs. So Bhakti influence is not something new in the understandings of uh, Dev's poetry. And we can easily add visual sources besides textual one. Secondly, as we are in a Krishna Bhakti context, it is possible to presume that many images on this topic are in circulation. Among the scenes which are depicted in paintings, 
the red lila is one of the painter's favorites. Therefore, we can be pretty sure that these kind of images are in the poet's mind. Thirdly, the structure of the painting, going from a center point to a peripheral space through concentric circles is, in a ve is very close to the structure of Dave's Naika bed. As we have six geographical spaces around the Raja in the Jati Beda, in this painting, we also have five circles which delineate specific spaces formed around Krishna. And each space is populated with one main motif. So we have really, we have here the center with Krishna and the gopi, okay? And then we have a first circle with the red color, which is already a specific space. Then we have a second one around the, the gopis, and, the, and there we have only the gopis dancing with Krishna. Then we have another one, uh, and we have there only the, music, the musicians, uh, in that specific space. Then we have uh, the trees who are like uh, another space. Um, and we have only trees in that space. And finally, we have the last um, circle uh, with also um, um, the people in the sky, which are depicted over there. So this is uh, once again, a definite space with with specific motives uh, inside. So this kind of structure is following the various spaces of the Naika Veda, where definite categories of Naikas are found in each space. And finally, fourth, um, fourth point uh, why um, we can maybe think of that kind of images it is um, the male figure, Krishna, who is in the center of the painting. So here, I agree he is uh, with a gopi dancing, but the Krishna figure, I mean, is bigger uh, than the female figure, and we are really focused uh, on him. So just like the king is in the center of the geographical space drawn in the Naika Veda, Krishna is dancing with all the gopis at the same time, just as the king of the Jati Beda rules over his entire kingdom and is understood as the Nayak of each Naika of his kingdom. The second set of images we can consider as in dialogue with Dave's Naika Beda is pa paintings depicting courtly settings and featuring the king in company of palace women. The painting structure is more or less the same as in the previous example about Krishna. At the center of the painting is the king in the middle of the pond or at the window in the middle of um, the palace frontage. Around him, women are placed in definite spaces. In the painting on the left, the same movement going from a centri, centri point to a peripheral space through concentric circles. In the background behind the walls of the palace, the outside life with the forest. So where we could imagine the other spaces because uh, from uh, the wall, we have all the spaces, the road, the forest, the villages, and so on. So what is particularly clear from the study and analyze of this visual material is the structure of these sources. With a male figure placed in the center of the picture and a world created around him, even, even created from him. And this, is, and this is what is done by Dev in his Jati Beda, where an entire world is created around the male figure of the Raja. 
this creation is not linear like in uh, the format list, um, which is traditional to Naïga Beda, but it's concentric here. The clearly delimited spaces in the paintings are also present in the Naïga Bed, where specific Naïgas live in specific spaces previously defined by, by the poet in relation to the Raja. And with this example, I will close my di discussion and conclude and stop here. And I really thank you for your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadir. Um, uh, are there any questions? I don't see any questions. Uh, would uh, yeah, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. Would, would you that like to? No question. Yeah. Sure, sir. You can go ahead. Yeah. I mean, Nadia, that this has been this had been a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, be, um, I request Satra to intervene. And before Satra intervenes, I like to have, make a few points. Mm. These are first of all. Okay, the way you have explained it, if we have to look into just what you have presented, we have to agree. But I have a few questions. Yes, please. Yeah. And I mean, those... it's, it's <laughs> yeah. please go. I mean, it's um, a kind of, you know, it's in construction and I'm really open to suggestions. Yeah, and, and to... that's why these questions are not too, you or myself, because um, I don't consider myself any expert in this field. So I have a few points, just a few points, and I hope Satrant will join the discussion and will be going ahead. Each and every uh, example that you have talked about are from 18th century to late 18th century. The only 17th century experience was the Boers. Uh, by that time, India was uh, primarily <clears throat> Persianalized. And uh, the examples that you have brought in are from a territory which has, which accepted partialization naturally, or they did accept it. I won't say naturally, but they did accept it. My questions are, you know, in the beginning you had uh, hinted to a very important point. The Sanskrit and Persian came together on which you have not really mm, went much. I think this might be a very important cue in understanding how this happened. I mean, how whatever you are studying happened. Apart from that, the kings that you have taught, Surajumal, etc., each of them agreed to the Persian or Mughal emperor agreed to that and accepted the culture. Diti Kal considered from an Indian Sanskritite perspective is uh, quote unquote, I'm sorry, quote unquote, I was going to say something which is not politically correct, quote unquote, not ours. Because Ritikal had this feature where they mingled the Persian influence so much that the Sanskritite scholars were hesitant in accepting it. Uh, this is the this is true for all the Rajasthani kingdoms. Yogini, 
if I talk from a purely Hindu perspective, Yogini is never an Aika. I mean, she cannot be put in two, five, four Naikas. She's too different from that. She's just too respectable to be feet into a paradigm of Naika. Uh, rest is, uh, my point is that all the examples are coming from, mo not from, not mostly, 18th century. Now, 18th century India is, uh, for now, for us, is a pre-modern India. What I think, it's, I'm not a medievalist, so please don't consider. That's why I said I'll talk first and then Satanath will engage because he is a medievalist. Um, 18th century or 17th century India is not a part of non partial India. What I found the most important thing though you have not delved on that much, that in this uh, Naika Veda, there might have been some passion. You have not dealt on that much in your later lectures. But I think, Anadia, if you consider that, then you might actually come up with a very interesting interpretation of how and why yogini becomes one of the naikas. As I said, yoginis are in the traditional Hindu stream, cannot be a naika. There's a, there's a two above of all that. And if Yogini was taken as a Naika in Naika Veda, this, that must be a Persian influence. Please look into that. And rest I am leaving to Satanath. Can I, can I answer? Yeah, sure. No, no, I did have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let us let okay. us have a discussion. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, comment. And um, I, I agree with you. I don't say that um, Persian influence are not there. I mean, at what I was not focused on that, but I mentioned that um, this particular Jati Beda is completely, in, um, in my opinion, influenced by Indo-Persian literature. And yeah. um, we find, um, also we find another poet who has a kind of um, um, similar Veda, but really shorter. I mean, Rahim uh, also um, exposed the Naika uh, in this way. So I'm totally, uh, I totally agree with you. We have Persian influence also. Yeah, uh, in, so uh, I request in index po poetry. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, of course, Naika Veda is also um, a tradition coming from the, San the Sanskrit literature. So it's for me, it was really important also to see uh, this uh, linearity between Sanskrit traditions and uh, Braj tradition, because we have all, all this Naika Beta stuff is in, in um, Alankara Shastras, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, ma in many poets' works, but also in Kama Shastras. And I think I have demonstrated in my thesis, um, in my PhD thesis, how much uh, Kama Shastras influence uh, Dave. Um, Poetry. But Nadia, um, Nadia, uh, okay, because we are discussing. Yes, Yogini of is not an Aika in yes. Tama Shastra because yes. Yogini cannot. Yogini comes from a tantric tradition where she cannot be an Aika. Yes, 
yes, your point is interesting and really I, I will think about it. But what I want to say is that, yes, you say Yogini is too respectable to be um, a Nike. Okay. And too, despise, but, too, too despisable as well. Yes, but I mean, we have the poem is here. <laughs> we have it. It's in Dev's works and we cannot say it's not there. So it is there. You so there must be a reason. There must be a cultural reason for which yeah. it happened. Yes. So I've tried to explain what is this reason, and you disagree with me. I, I've understood, but I would say so. Were from Persian? What is this Persian influence uh, of the U? Because I see uh, this visual influence for me is quite. Um, I mean, we can argue, of course, but I mean, why not follow my point? And yes, um, sure. <laughs> and um, um, in in which text, uh, in which Persian text, uh, do we have a description of the yogini, uh, which could have been taken by them? Do you have? No, examples? I don't. I don't have. Okay. Okay. So I have this... I have the I have the texts of Hindu tradition where yogini yogini cannot be an aika. Yes, yes. So but... the point is, if uh, in Ritikal someone is calling yogini an aika, that means that person must have taken a cue, not necessarily in the name of yogini, from a Persian text. Yeah. And if we can come down to that and point down that. That would be an interesting point. Yes, of course, of course. Thank you. It it, it will be an interesting <laughs> point. Maybe it, it, I it, can it, I can add this to my view. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, Satyanath sir also has something to. Yeah. Sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, that was a wonderful talk, um, uh, Dr. Nadia Katani. You know, I'm. It's very. Um, thought provoking and uh, you know as uh, uh, we all felt when we read your uh, paper uh, which has been circulated that uh, your uh, statement there was highly provocative and it's provocative and well evidenced okay. i have two or three points to add one of them is the way that the naika beda theme appears as you have traced it in the Braj tradition, the mapping appears to be slightly bigger. Bigger in the sense, uh, if I just uh, quote, you know, this is uh, Narayan Rao, David Shulman, and Sanjay Subramaniam, symbols of substance, the Nayaka rule in South India. This, this is post uh, Vijayanagar period, but they still say that we start seeing a bold woman as the heroine in Telugu, Kannada, Marathi, and Kannada poet, uh, Kavya system. For example, uh, you know, courtesans becoming the heroines, courtesans becoming queens. You know, Krishna Devaraya's queen, her uh, queen was actually Chinna Sani. So the word Sani suggests that she is from uh, a courtesan, and in Madurai. Uh, you know, uh, Raghunatha Nayaka Abhyudayamu and such texts, which are written as the biography or the charita of the king, you know, again subsume a similar position. You know, he, the, the poetry, the text starts with the description of the uh, king having spent his na previous night on the in the in the quarters of the courtesan, and both of them are going on a procession on the on the street. Um, and this poetry is ascribed to his own son, you know. So, so they they observe that there is a paradigm shift in the way that uh, the that uh, women other than queens, quote unquote, you know, traditional heroines being replaced by uh, here nayakis of a different type. So uh, it could be seen, for example, in a variety of ways. The, Kavya, the, the heroines of the Kavya need not necessarily be the, the, the Ashtanayakis. They could be beyond that, you know, uh, the categories. Secondly, I think the, 
the nature of uh, appreciation of uh, this uh, genre also increases for example you know if i say with uh, reference to kannada literature the number of kama sutra texts increases from about 11th to 12th century and as you go down more and more versions uh, then commentaries on that uh, so in order to make the text available for the public i think it is at this intersection that the a paradigm shift from this cultural tradition to the painting tradition starts and the painting tradition provides accommodation for a lot of details i uh, 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 amitabh pointed out the 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 conspicuous or the curious case of uh, uh, jogini being uh, there in the uh, pa ragmala paintings and other uh, paintings i wouldn't find it uh, that surprising because first of all in this sculptural tradition you know this is particularly orissa konark sculptures the one full wall is full of uh, women playing musical instruments including the drums and this uh, goes back to the beginning of the second millennia around around 1200 or something like that so there is an evidence to say that women musical instrument and then its depiction in the indian um, representational system that is that thing is possible and thirdly i think we should know the jogini and the raga like asaveri starts coming from around 1450 onward this is the time that people have ascribed for the beginning of the now i was and fourthly i think around 12th century or a little earlier you know in tamil it is slightly earlier but in kannada at least around 1150 you have a, a a a great number of women saints appearing you know kannada appears to have about 33 of them who have written poems and there is at least reference to 55 of them according to scholars some of them have their poems are not available uh, the most important example being the akamaha devi um, who is who actually said to have roamed naked in from place to place as a as a mendicant now i think this this image uh, is not a very strange image i am not correlating akamaha devi and yogini but the very fact this yogini is decorated with musical instrument so now i am starting again my trajectory for you if i have understood your talk properly Uh, around 12th 13th century sculptural representation of women performing music musical text emerging in great number from around 12th 50 12th 30 starting from sarangadeva's sangeetha ratnakara and then there are about 70 texts which have been identified in the next 4 500 years ragmala painting starting somewhere around uh, 1450 yeah. and bhakti reaching its peak around 1400 so there is i'm i'm talking in not in terms of other details but trying to bring in details associated with music into the uh, type of uh, construction that uh, nadia is trying to do and probably you know i i will also there is a last uh, point that i would like to add to this the last point is ras rasavilasa uh, sorry rasavilasa ras itself is linked to dance circles music you know see uh, before we saw raso as a genre it is referred to in hemachandra as a sort of a dance which is performed in circles with men and women together you know which picks up a radha krishna connotation so this circularity rasa women i i mean i'm 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 particularly interested and impressed by the circles that you put uh, for both at the end and towards the thing with king as the center which for me is not very far off from the medieval kingship system and the kavya system because it is it is nagara as the capital of the king which is at the center of the description of the kavya the 18 descriptions that the kavya has you know actually constitute this 
this system. You know, if you deconstruct the 18 descriptions, they go to it. For example, including many of the descriptions, Sambhoga Varnanam, then um, um, Jalakrida Varnanam, water sport, they are all the sports that the kings king play. So there, I, I believe if, if, if these things are acceptable, many of the material for the, nine, yeah, for the 18th, 19th century bridge writers were coming maybe via the cosmopolitan Sanskrit literary conventions. So in a, in a, I, th I think in a, it, it, the only remarkable thing that happens is the sculptural and the literary medium switches over to the painting medium, which is very rich, colors, details, including the, the including the erotic uh, material uh, in on the paper is much more detailed and and is much more clear compared to an erotic sculpture that you see on the um, on, uh, in in sculpture so i i particularly see a continuity going on from the say early pre 10th century period into that and spilling over into the uh, the medium is changing. Interestingly, I'm also I would I'm also trying to bring how the literary media as well as the visual media is gradually changing, and I think the most important thing to notice here is the music as a form that that means the sonar and museum uh, media has been incorporated into many of these representations. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you to you. This is really important uh, thoughts and important points and arguments. So thank you very much. Uh, really, thanks. Uh, yes, so uh, Amitav, sir, you have something to add very briefly because we've run out of time. Your hand is raised. Yeah. <laughs> OK, very briefly then. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll be brief. Uh, so Nadia, my uh, my point of departure will be canonical. Uh, whatever you have, whatever example you have talked about uh, starts from 1590. That's the earliest. Am I right on that? You mean in the images I, I, I have used? We yeah. have some, we have some example of 15th century, if I'm not mistaken, but. Um, okay. Okay, then I, I might be. Yes, wrong. maybe uh, I can't remember, but yes, of course, they are. They are. They are um, 17th. Yeah, between 17 and beginning of 18th. Yes, you're right. So what I am trying to make a point is that uh, because I, I think if you delve more into it, this will help us in understanding ourselves more. Uh, you are dealing with this timeline where we had already met the Persian tradition. Yes, obviously. And um, Yogini becoming a Naika, I'm again repeating that, okay? Yogini becoming a Naika would not have happened in a Hindu situation. Yeah. <laughs> it must have happened either in a Buddhist situation or a Parso Arabic influenced Indian situation. Please look into that. If you, I mean, what I am requesting is that if you come out with that, that a Parso Arabic uh, postulation of womenhood actually influence making yogini and naika in Indian understanding, then that would be an excellent, excellent contribution to us understanding ourselves, particularly in the current situation. Okay, thank you. I've heard your point. Yeah, <laughs> <Sure. thank> you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, um, I'd just like to quickly thank Dr. Katoni for really taking uh, you know, yes, your sir, time just out. Just a single comment. Can I make yes, a sir. comment? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Go ahead, uh, sir. I think, you know, Amitabh, uh, I want to continue that. And I also, I want to provide a hint uh, to Professor Katoni. Uh, how about looking at Pari 
of the European and uh, Yogini as compatibles. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm risking a very big comparison. <laughs> Pari lives in Pari land. Though Pari is... Actually, yeah, Satnat, you are, you are risking a lot. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Though Pari is in the, uh, in the Pari land, and though Pari is a very negative image within the Persia, Persian tradition, she is not in the Indian tradition. In the Indian tradition, she is equivalent of Apsara. That is uh, one thing. And secondly, there is, by, by that time, there is enough lore about Pari to the extent that seven Paris, six Paris become the heroines of the first Indian play written, Indra Sabha, written in 1862. So I think in the, in the 18th century and the worldview and slightly below, there is something that was operating. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, saying that this, this is for sure, but if we are trying to see and wonder why is uh, uh, Yogini getting into the representations here, I think you know, we have to think of solutions looking into other contemporary forms. One such form that struck me was actually Indra Sabha as a play. Oh, I think then I'll stop. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you. So, as I was saying, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Katoni, for taking the time out and for joining us today. I mean, your paper has really enriched all of us, you know, with the understanding of intermediality that you have brought and your in-depth analysis of Dave's poetry and maybe your uh, suggestion also to maybe look into uh, visuality uh, for, you know, a means to construct a literary history even. So thank you so much, Dr. Nadia Katoni. Thank you. Thank, we'll, you. Um, thank you. So we'll stop here for now and we'll meet so back at five o'clock. Yes. Yeah, Nilja. I'm, I'm yes, sir. A, pardon me because Nilja is my student, so I can, mm -hmm. uh, like Satanath can. Mm, uh, we would really like to um, have a paper from you where you can look into the inclusion of Yogini in the Naikas in the context of Parso-Arabic influence in India. If you could do that, please do that. <laughs> That's a request. Okay. <laughs> Great yes. then. Uh, I'll end the meeting here for now.